Welcome to an Apple a Day, a podcast, a resource, a community. Share your experiences and learn from others as we overcome barriers and learn to live a happy and healthy life. Not as disabled people, but as people with a disability. Welcome to the community. Here's your host, Jimmy Apple. Welcome to another episode of An Apple a Day. I'm your host, Jimmy Apple. How are you feeling today, my friends? You're feeling good? You're feeling strong? You're feeling better than you did yesterday? Excellent. You can't ask for better than that. I want to remind you, An Apple a Day is brought to you by www.famousapple.com. So if you get a chance, check it out. While you're tripping around the web, make sure you stop by our Facebook page, it's called Living with a Disability. People over there asking questions, answering questions, making friends, chatting, talking, laughing. So, do you get a minute? Check that out. You can get there by going to www.famousapple.com forward slash group. Or you can just go to Facebook and look up Living with a Disability. It's an Apple a Day page. But... The easiest way is go to www.famousapple.com forward slash group. Hey, have you checked out the Apple Fritters yet? That's right. We come out five days a week every morning at 4 a.m. And there's a new Apple a Day Fritter podcast. It's a five minute podcast and it's full of information on different topics. It comes out every morning and so far it's been a hit the numbers are up and people are liking it we're getting a lot of good feedback on it so if you haven't checked it out check it out monday through friday comes out four o'clock every morning a brand new podcast five minute episode maybe maybe five between five and ten minutes but usually five minutes it's a short one they got great topics and a lot of information so check it out if you haven't checked it out Check it out. We got a great one for you today. It's with Dr. Christopher Scott Wyatt. It's dealing with autism in school. And why is this such a good podcast? Because Dr. Christopher Scott Wyatt is autistic himself. And he's a, he's a college professor. Now, I'm going to let David introduce Dr. Wyatt. So sit back for a second. Relax. And listen to what David has to say. Who is Dr. Christopher Wyatt? Dr. Christopher Scott Wyatt is an autistic self-advocate and father of two neurodiverse daughters. He earned a doctorate while researching online education for students with autism spectrum disorders. His experiences living with physical and neurological differences shape his parenting. Wyatt consults with schools, businesses, and nonprofit organizations on issues of autism, neurodiversity, and active inclusion. As a speaker with more than 150 regional and national appearances and 15 years of consulting experience, he discusses autism, parenting, and education from the autistic perspective. The Autistic Me blog was launched in January 2007 when he began working on behalf of others with special needs. He completed his doctoral studies in 2010 at the University of Minnesota. While a doctoral student, he conducted two grant-funded research projects on autism and instructional technology. He has published in academic journals, co-edited a scholarly collection, and has presented numerous conference papers. Reflecting his passion for digital media, he also completed a Master of Fine Arts in Film and Digital Technology, a Master of Arts in English Composition Theory and Rhetoric, and undergraduate degrees in English and journalism. And now, I'm going to turn this back over to Jimmy. Well, thanks, Dave. And without further ado, no more fluff, I'm going to introduce you to Dr. Christopher Wyatt. Well, as I told you, I have Dr. Christopher Wyatt with us today, and I'm going to just jump right into it. How are you doing, sir? How are you today, Christopher? Very well, thank you. Christopher, can you tell our audience a little bit about yourself? Well, I am a 
I guess former now university instructor. I am the parent of two wonderful neurodiverse daughters. I am, I hope, a reasonably good husband to a wonderful wife. <laughs> and we are very fortunate to be a, a family that was uh, by choice, which I talk about quite a bit when I do presentations and conferences. I became an autistic self-advocate during graduate school as I found that higher education, though many professors are associated with what they consider progressive ideas, diversity, inclusion, the, the reality is even in higher education, they weren't ready for disabled students, students with zero diversity. And I saw that my colleagues who are blind or deaf or in other ways different did experience obstacles in environments that are supposedly the most welcoming. So that's when I started to convert the Autistic Me blog to a wider audience. That was 2007. And we have continued to add on from speaking engagements in the blog. We added the podcast six years ago. And I recently renamed that from just the Autistic Me to Perspectives on Neurodiversity as, again, being a speaker and being out there as an advocate and doing in-services at colleges and universities, uh, public in, uh, public schools, I found that neurodiversity, when I speak about it, I need to be more inclusive. That also was brought to my attention through my daughters. I need to um, be an advocate, not just for the autistic or those with ADHD, which also includes me, but those with PTSD, those with dyslexia, those with any other form of neuro difference. So I am a neurodiversity advocate uh, probably most of the time now. I, I will say that I stepped away from teaching after the end of 2021. We are um, in a situation where, again, the school system not being set up for neurodiversity and difference we are still homeschooling even after COVID, our youngest daughter. And again, these are all things that are my life as, as an advocate and as a, as a parent. So that's what I do is I speak to institutions that want to know how to better accommodate neurodiversity and other forms of disability. And I try to be, um, I try to be as best I can honest about the fact that my experiences are just mine and often I have to mention other experiences because disabilities are all different and needs are all different and so that's something that um, I try to tell every K-12 teacher, every college instructor, every university professor I speak to um, that I can only speak from an advocacy perspective that's informed by my life as a disabled individual, as a parent, as a student and as a teacher. Well, let, let me just step back one second. When were you actually diagnosed with autism? So the autism diagnosis is a complex problem of labels. Until the DSM-4 text revision, which came along pretty late in the 1980s, my initial diagnosis was mental retardation and brain trauma. So until they started to change the diagnostic criteria, which are a moving target, my autism label was not applied until 2007. Really? And again, and again, this is a problem with the DSM. For those not familiar with the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of the Mental Health Professions, the DSM is a committee, right? It gets together through the American Psychiatric Association and they decide what the categories will or won't be. So with the DSM-5, they changed quite a few diagnoses and threw them into autism only recently. So PDD-NOS, which is pervasive developmental disorder, was moved into autism. You see things that used to be called Asperger's or high-functioning autism, now just called autism. Um, they also break out things. So when there is a causal determination made like Rett syndrome or fragile X, 
then they move that out of autism because it becomes a medical condition. So when we talk about these labels for mental health disabilities, the mental health disabilities really are dependent on the checklist determined by the psychiatrist. So my label today may not be my label with the DSM-6 or the if there's a DSM-5 text revision. So unfortunately what happens is your labels change throughout life if you're dealing with mental health. The flip side of that is my physical disabilities. I have partial paralysis of my right arm, Jacksonian seizures. Those things will never change, right? The paralysis, they're not going to relabel it something. Right. Um, but they will relabel other things, uh, especially mental health they'll relabel. And some medical conditions that were unfortunately named. So any medical condition named for someone who ends up having been associated with, say, Germany during World War II, those scientists, some diseases and things were named for them. So those have been moved. In autism, Asperger's syndrome, Hans Asperger was a Nazi. There's indications that he was involved in some of the um, eugenics movement. So now what was Asperger's, they moved into autism, and they're trying to remove his name from that diagnosis of what used to be called high-functioning or Asperger's syndrome. Right. I, I actually have a, had a neighbor in South Carolina whose son was diagnosed with Asperger's. So now that's... Yeah, and that now is, is strictly, uh, they now strictly move that to the autism okay. spectrum disorder, and then they give it a category on the matrix, but they no longer want to use Hans Asperger's name. And not for, not for a, a poor reason. I think it's fully justified to dump the name of anyone associated with Nazis. All right, now I have another question. So pre-2007, you were diagnosed as, as um, retarded, for lack of a better word? That the, the mental retardation was removed, I believe, from the DSM in 1980. So throughout the 1970s, uh, I would have had that label as an elementary student and the brain trauma, left frontal lobe uh, incursion. So those labels would have stuck. The cognitive impairment, I think, became the label in the 1980s. Uh, obviously, brain trauma stays because it's an actual physical injury. Right. Um, and so that stayed from birth. That did not change, uh, nor did the uh, brachial plexus injury and the, and the paralysis. But yes, the label kept changing. So until 1980, it was mental retardation. 1980 or so, it became cognitive impairment and brain trauma. And then by 2007... I had gone through the ADHD, OCD, other things that they kept labeling. And then in 2007, at the University of Minnesota, they required another assessment. And I had not been assessed since the mid-1990s, so nearly a decade had gone by. So the new assessment then reflected the new labels and new criteria from the APA the, the DSM-4 TR at that time, the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual fourth revision, text revision, that one is the one where they decided I, I moved into autistic. Wow. And, and this is why I tell people that when we get wedded to a label, and in, Many advocates do, especially in the autistic and, and other parts of the neurodiverse community. You know, I am autistic or I am as, uh, an Aspie. Those labels change so frequently. I can say as someone in my 50s that don't get too wedded to it because your label, thanks to the psychiatrist who make up these checklists, your label will change. <laughs> it just <Yeah>. will. <laughs> so so don't, don't get the, you know, I am this too ingrained in your mind. Instead, I tell people, think about who you are and be proud of who you are and be aware that these people who have authority over us in our billing codes for insurance and our placement codes for special education, they're going to change our labels. All we need to know is my brain, uh, my neurology works the way it works, and that's just the way it is. And whatever label the experts want to give me or my daughter's, um, that doesn't matter. The label is there, and it's to help, I guess, with 
the classification and stuff. But I, unlike many autistic advocates, I just can't get wedded to the, the I am autistic. It, it's more like this is my current label and, or a label I have been given that might change. What matters more to me are the supports I need or the way I need to support myself. Well, right now you're on the right podcast because on this podcast, we, we push the fact that there is no such thing as a disabled person. We're all people. We just happen to have some disabilities. So it just slows us down a little bit in some areas, but we're still people. So labels don't mean a thing here. If that was the case, I'd need to carry a billboard around to, to take care of, to write down all my disabilities. But, and yeah, and, and that's where, that's where I get challenged. I, I am fine saying, you know, I am autistic instead of I am an individual with autism. But then the problem becomes, do I, where do I put paralyzed? Where do I put dyslexic? Where do I put ADHD? Where do I put... Um, the various seizures and all these, where do I put them all? You don't have to and, put them all. See, that's the thing. That's the thing that people get hung up on. It's nobody's business that you're autistic or you have the ADHD. If you can function, that's your business. There's no reason to tell, you know, unless, unless what you have is affecting someone else, if it's affecting you and you can get over those hurdles, there's no reason that to, to advertise it to anybody else. What's what would be the reason? Well, in unfortunately, in education, it it really is mandatory. the The challenges you hit in education with disclosure are numerous. First of all, you don't get the services you need. Especially, your child won't get services without those assessments and those labels. So in the case of a dyslexic student who might need more time for assignments and tests, you have to have the label. I, My, I'm not arguing in that. I'm not. And the problem is that uh, the challenge is that people, people look at those labels and they misunderstand them. And, and by that, what I mean is uh, on every podcast, every speaking engagement, every time I get to be on a stage or a platform or whatever, Mm -hmm. I tell people the real solution is not to have all these checklists and disclosures. Instead, if every teacher just asked every student, how can I help you do better? How can I help you learn better? If every employer asked, how can I help you work better? How can I help you help us more? And then if I said, okay, I'm going to need a little bit more time reading, or I'm going to need a trackball instead of a mouse because of my mobility issues. If I could just say what I need without having to fill out a bunch of forms, that would stop dehumanizing us as disabled individuals. But instead, because of the law like ADA, like IDEA, the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act, all of these laws require disclosure. So what we really say is instead of employers and schools having to just be good people who ask, how can we help everyone? We get them already programmed to say, do you have a disability? Okay, which disability is it? Let me check all these boxes. Okay, now these are the federally mandated supports. Okay, these are what our state says. Okay, now this is what our school district says. And so what happens by not just taking the attitude of all people have needs, we should ask those people what their needs are and help them. Instead of doing that by saying, okay, we got to fill out forms to be in federal, state, and local compliance, what happens is you can't escape the labels. The labels become just what you need to get through the schools, to get through the universities, and unfortunately, to get through employment. And this is the absurdity of treating people like things instead of recognizing that everybody I've ever met has some area where they need support. I agree with you, but I think the, the problem is is that we've become such a litigious society that people look for ways to say, you didn't ask me. It becomes the responsibility yeah. of the person with the disability to ask for that help. Absolutely, and that's why it's, it's unfortunate that we have to do this, but 
as parents of disabled individuals, mm-hmm. um, it's important to tell your, your child, your teen, your young adult, the world is how it is. School districts get sued. Employers get sued. Sure. Your, your responsibility to yourself, not to other people, your responsibility to yourself is to step into HR, to go to disability services, to go to the counseling department and say, I have disabilities. Here's what they are. Now that we've recorded them, can I just go back to work? Right. Exactly. But I agree with you. The, the sad reality is that well-meaning laws, the ADA is certainly an important law. It is a well, well-intentioned law. But what has happened is through, through, like you said, the litigiousness of society, the, um, the lack of common decency that we have as people, it becomes necessary for the disabled to go in and to declare things. And... We don't trust people exactly. to tell us what they need. We don't believe their needs. Exactly. I, I agree. I'm thinking, I'm thinking of, of just this last few weeks. So our oldest, um, she has experienced very rapid vision loss. Mm-hmm. And it turns out to be degenerative myopia. Right. And so she's headed towards what could be without intervention, um, legally um, being blind. It, and, you know, every time I have to take her out of class, right, and take her to a doctor and bring her back, we have to fill out the paperwork at the school, fill out the touch screen. Then when we come back, we have to have the doctor's know. We have to have evidence of this. And I understand why schools do this, but what schools are saying is we don't trust the parent and we don't trust the student. We're not going to believe that you saw a doctor without proof of it, which when you think about it, the doctor's note is forcing you to disclose because the doctor's office will say what type of doctor it is. I know. I know. So every time someone requires you to document something, instead of taking your word, instead of just, you know, as a, as a university professor, if a student comes to me and says, I had something personal I had to deal with, I tell my students, okay, as long as you make up the work, thank you for telling me you had something important, we're done. Then they'll ask, well, do I need to bring you a note? Because every other professor requires a note. It's like, look, you are a young adult. You're 17, 18 years old or more. I can trust you. If you say you had a personal thing to deal with, I'm going to take your word. Now just go back, do the work, and we're good. And this really surprises students because they have been programmed – since kindergarten, you need a note. It needs to say what type of doctor's appointment. It needs to say what happened. It needs to then give, you know, we have to give things to the nurse. And this lack of trust is why disclosure is unavoidable and why I'm teaching my daughters that they have to disclose, not because I think we should disclose, uh, but because that's how we treat people. We treat people as checklists, whether it's the DSM checklist or the school checklist of what accommodations a student is eligible for, every one of these things reduces us to human checklists. But this is the way society has become. It wasn't like this when, when, we, were, when we were younger. I'm a little bit older than you are, but when we were younger, if you recall, it wasn't always like this. And it comes down to that cliche, one bad apple. But, you know, one bad apple spoils the whole bunch. When you get people that are faking the system, that are pulling these shenanigans, for lack of a better word, then it makes it look bad for everyone. Everyone has to suffer for the few, if, if you know what I, I mean. I will say, it. I can think of examples where, yes, people exploit the law. And these are the people who want to bring, in, in all seriousness, this has really happened, their service hamster. Right. to school or their support animal. Right, exactly. Uh, yeah, I'm sorry, your hamster is not a support animal <laughs> under any definition of the ADA. It just isn't. Um, and so what happens is things like that occur and people start saying, oh, no, you have to prove it, document, bring in your paperwork right. that shows that this is a support animal, show what it's been trained to do. And, um, and, and certainly not to make light of those that you know, certainly have – emotional needs and that's what uh, an animal can provide but 
there are people who exploit these just to to get away with things. Right. Um, and and unfortunately, as we have seen with the ADA in uh, California, there were a, a string of lawsuits uh, where a gentleman was going up and down the Central Coast, going into restaurants, looking for ADA violations, and then threatening to sue. I, I know these things happen. And unfortunately, for those of us with disabilities, we need the ADA because some employers and some schools won't accommodate us. Yet at the same time, we wouldn't need any of this if we go back to what I had said of people just saying, what do you need and how can I help you? Right, exactly. I agree with you 100%. But that's the way it used to be. But as, as society has grown and we become quote unquote more progressive like you said people have you know support hamsters and I, I do believe that we have we have overshot in many ways with our advocacy I I am very aware of my daughter's needs and my needs and mm -hmm. I do believe my daughter deserves a needs supports at school. Both of my daughters have special needs. There's no I, question. I agree. And, and it would be great if I could just go to the teacher and say, okay, this, my youngest has dyslexia. How can we help her at home? How can we help her in the, in the classroom? But instead, we have a teacher shortage. We have a lack of paraprofessionals. And so my wife and I have decided to homeschool. And part of that is that the school has checklists. Your, your kid is a checklist and these are the supports and these are the supports we will provide instead of meeting the need for every individual. And the great irony is the federal program call uh, the IDEA calls for an individualized education program. But in the end, what they do is they have checklists. Oh, this is what we do for the deaf. This is what we do for the autistic. This is what we do for the orthopedically, uh, different. So they don't treat people as individuals because that would take too much time. No, you're right. You're absolutely right. Everything is bunched. Everything's in a category. And I wish we could step away from that. And that's why I make such a big deal about it. And I call it natural accommodation. I have also called it uh, true inclusiveness. I don't want to be tolerated. I see a shirt that says, you know, tolerance. I tolerate uh, the taste of medicine. You know, the, the taste of bad medicine, I'll tolerate it. When I see the this, this slogan tolerance, I don't want tolerance for disability. No. I, makes it so, I don't want to be, don't tolerate me. And, and when they say awareness, well, oh, good, you're aware of us. You're aware that I need a cane sometimes. You're aware that my daughters and I and my wife, you know, that we have glasses. I, I don't I don't want just awareness. I don't want tolerance. I want true inclusiveness. Exactly. I want to be able to participate as a citizen, as an employee, as an entrepreneur, whatever I want to be, I want to participate in. And I don't want these dictated by checklists and uh, accommodation, uh, prepackaged solutions. Well, when I hear someone say they, there's tolerance or there are, I find those words Highly, highly insulting. I, I, they I, are. I find them highly insulting. They, they're showing tolerance because I'm in a wheelchair. Oh, great, great. Thank you very much. I find them it, highly insulting. But I find that when I talk about natural accommodations, and I point out that when you make a space that's open access to all individuals. You're making a better space for everyone. I had a situation where a wheelchair ramp failed at one of the universities where I was teaching. The dean was amazing. He made sure that that ramp was fixed. They poured new concrete, fixed the ramp. And you know what you see is just days later, it's not the faculty like myself with a cane or a wheelchair that benefited. Every faculty member was now able to wheel their carts with their computers or sure. push their media carts. Suddenly that ramp was used again by everybody. It was not about disability. We're in a world where everyone's carrying a 50-pound backpack. Everyone's pushing around a media cart on a university campus. 
the ramps are not about just the disabled. The ramps are about just getting on with life for everybody. Exactly. So when you point that out and you say, that is what I mean when I talk about inclusive, I'm not saying do something special. I'm saying that the things that benefit me probably benefit other people too. Mm -hmm. Exactly. But, but again, like you said, we, we are caught up in these checklists and, and it's really to the detriment, especially of our children, uh, these laws and these regulations that have taken the place of really treating students as individuals. Again, it is very sad that we needed laws to tell teachers to treat students with disabilities with some respect. But too many teachers treat those, te those students and the paperwork now as a burden. Yes, exactly. Yeah, it's funny. It's not just the dis disabled. It's now it's it's everybody. Everybody is treated as as a group. Nobody is treated as an individual anymore. It's treated you're treated by race, by religion, by <laughs> origin, where you came from. It, it it's it's sickening. It's sickening the way society is going, and it's only getting worse. It's not getting any better. Well, and unfortunately for the disabled, we we suffer from high un underemployment rates, high unemployment rates. We many of us found that the many of us found success during the COVID lockdowns because suddenly it was able to be proven to employers. I can work from home. Exactly. I can do things with my <laughs> computer set up the way I need it to be, with my trackball instead of a mouse, with my dictation software instead of a keyboard some days, that I could succeed at home and be productive. And instead, as soon as the pandemic ended, they're like, well, come back to the office. So they're once again asking us to commute. They're once again saying, now come into a desk that's not designed for you. Mm -hmm. Come use a computer that doesn't have the accommodations you need. And then they wonder, they're like, wow, you were really productive at home, but why is it so hard for you in the office? Well, you know, Christopher, the, the one truth here is the most neglected minority in the world are the disabled people. Think about it. It doesn't matter what color you are, where you came from. Disabled people, one big bunch, we're the most neglected minority in the world. I, I will say it definitely gets worse according to the statistics that, that I follow as a now, you know, basically a former researcher. Because as I said, I've chosen to, to be homeschooling my daughter right now. Um, the data I used to look at and, and follow up until last year really did reflect that those individuals from lower socioeconomic backgrounds can't get the assessments to get the mental health supports they need. They can't always get the orthopedic help they need if they have a physical disability. As, as, a, as a note, so my, my oldest with the myopia, the degenerative myopia, mm -hmm. our insurance will not cover FDA-approved treatment for myopia. Now, degenerative myopia leads to macular degeneration and blindness. She has progressed from mild to severe in, a, in less than six months. Insurance won't cover it. Now, we are blessed you know, that I could, out of our HSA account and our personal savings and some other uh, resources, take care of it. But we're talking about a treatment that is anywhere from $1,300 to $2,000 a year. Not everyone can do that. So what that means is that if you don't have the means to treat the myopia, you will go blind. What kind of world wants to create further disability? I, I just, I'm flummoxed. I, to me, if I'm paying my insurance premiums, my wife is paying you know, through her company, and we've done everything right, insurance is supposed to ensure the unexpected event. This is definitely unexpected. Um, if you don't treat her situation, she, she becomes more costly because being blind is going to require more accommodation. Well, here, I've got one for you. I know someone personally right now that's going through this. They've gone deaf in one ear. Now, there's a treatment that, that there's two treatments. 
One is a steroid shot in the ear, but if they're profoundly deaf, the steroid shot won't work. The other right. option is a hyperbaric chamber. But here in New York, there's two insurances that won't cover the hyperbaric chamber. One is Medicare, and the other is Empire Blue Cross and Blue Shield. Well, of course, they have Empire Blue Cross and Blue Shield and Medicare. Neither one of them will cover it. It's to get the co- to get it done to get the the hyperbaric chamber done. It'll cost them, I think, it's sixteen hundred dollars a week to do it and they need eight weeks and they don't have the money to do this so one of the i'm sorry go ahead one of the great myths that we hear in america in the united states is that while other countries have national health care as a speaker and as a um, advocate i work with people all over the world the Australian system, which is dual private public, there are certain disabilities where they put a cap on it. Canada, until very recently, had a very strict cap on autism treatment and how much a child could cost. Canada actually had a immigration policy where if you were going to cost them over a certain amount of money per year, your immigration visa would be denied. So these countries that have these health care systems The reality is the only way you can cover costs is to cap them because the money and the personnel is limited. Right. You don't have doctors for everything. You don't have doctors and nurses everywhere. We don't have treatments available in every city, every county. Well, this is true in Germany. It's true in France. It's true everywhere. And so even if you have a nationalized health system, the very ugly truth, the very ugly truth is disability is expensive. Of course it is. Of course it is. And I say that as someone who advocates very very staunchly for governments to, to operate within their means, to control waste, control you know fraud, abuse, whatever. But the reality is disabilities are expensive. Uh, my daughter's um, back brace, the eldest, uh, her back brace for scoliosis, that's a $4,000 expense. She's going to go through three or four of those things. Mm-hmm as she goes into her teenage years, she's going to go through who, well, she went through five eyeglass prescriptions in a year. Most insurance will cover one. Exactly. So disability by its very nature is expensive. And as long as, as a society, we don't prioritize people. We prioritize other things. Um, the reality is, is that we all end up having to make a choice of, what can we do without? How disabled am I willing to be? What accommodations am I willing to to try to do without? Um, and I and I say this as I said, I am a I am someone who is very uh, aware of cost, and I understand cost benefit. I understand that no country on earth can cover all of these costs, and that reality is a scary and difficult reality. But I don't. I don't believe that when people say, oh, well, all we need is Medicare for all, or all we need is a national system like elsewhere, the reality is whether you're in Canada, Australia, the UK, it is very hard to get a mental health evaluation. It is extremely hard to get supports for physical disabilities. You end up at the bottom of waiting list if you get other complications. And God forbid you're older. There are no good answers. God forbid you're older. Oh, Oh, yes. Yeah. If you're older, you're even further on the wait list or you do, you're not eligible. Exactly. Exactly. If you're after and, a certain age, you've, you've outlived your usefulness. And that's true in the social democracies of Europe. It's true throughout Asia, which uh, there are some amazing healthcare systems that are totally inclusive, but they are collapsing under the weight of the cost. Of course. Um, a great series was done by the online publication Vox. VOX, mm-hmm. where they looked at national health care systems globally and found that all of them failed the disabled. Well, yeah. It takes special doctors. It takes special treatments. It takes all this stuff that the ugly truth is that we are, as you said, as a community, the disabled are already at the bottom. And then if you add to it, as I said, that you are 
uh, outside of the correct social economic background, if you happen to be uh, in any way outside of the norms, it, it becomes even harder and harder to get those supports. The ugly reality in every nation that I've, where I've spoken, where I've done virtual stuff, rural communities, whether it's um, the farmlands inside of, of France or Germany, Canada, especially, you get into the rural areas, there are no hospitals. There are no orthopedists. There are no people to make um, the back braces. There are no people who specialize in prosthetics. All of these people live and work in the big cities. Yeah. And they only take certain insurance and they only do certain things through the national health system. Or, and so I don't have good answers. What I can say is it should all start with just human decency. Um, human decency would change so much because I don't care how many laws you pass. You can pass all the laws you want declaring that everyone's great, everyone's equal, and we're going to take care of it. But if the attitudes of the teachers, if the attitudes of the doctors, if the attitudes of our employers don't change, no law is going to change their hearts. This is true. Well, you can't, but you, you can't, you can't legislate people to be good. <laughs> it's impossible. Unfortunately, I would say, you know, I, I say this um, as a teacher. And as an educator has watched what's happened in some of our schools, the civil rights legislation was necessary. Unfortunately, sometimes you have to pass laws to change people. But the sad truth is that since we have seen the, the civil rights legislation pass, what has happened is our schools have resegregated, our universities have resegregated, that all of these well-intentioned laws that sadly were absolutely necessary, Eisenhower, sending the National Guard to help to help um, break segregation in the South. I think Eisenhower did the absolute right thing. But the problem is, is that parents with means, parents with money, whatever, can get their kids to a private school that's what they want. They can get their kid the medical care they need. They can get them the special supports they want. They can go doctor shopping for the diagnosis they want. Um, the rest of us have to compete for what's left. And unfortunately, I think that our society lacks uh, kindness. It's oh, Too many people have the tolerance and the acceptance and all these other shirts and slogans and bumper stickers. And yet, when you ask them, so where does your kid go? Oh, well, my kid's at the private char you know, at the private school down. Oh, oh, okay. You know, where do you live? Well, I live in the gated community. I, you know, so I've, you know, I've used the, the, the phrase, the limousine liberal, um, sadly, universities, which are supposed to be these great and inclusive places where I've worked, I look around and I see very um, homogeneous populations. I see mainly upper middle class and upper class students from good families who don't have any disabilities, who didn't have any particular struggles. And where those students used to go, the state universities are, are poorly supported. The K-12s are a mess right now, especially with the the lockdown from the last two years, which um, imposed significant penalties on the disabled. Um, there, there was just, I don't know, I get frustrated and keep saying to myself and to everyone who will listen, what has to change is the attitude of just asking, what can I do to help you and let me help you? Then, then we wouldn't need all this, all this bureaucracy that, that turns us into lists and numbers. But Sadly, there are just a lot of there are a lot of people who aren't really compassionate, and many of them cloak themselves in all the right bumper stickers, posters, and slogans. But they're not actually compassionate. They're not actually inclusive. Well, well, two things I I, I just have to say that uh, to answer what you just said, you know, it seems like you're mad at the people that have the means to send their kids to private school. And I don't see why you would be mad if they if they worked and they saved their money and they send their kids to private school, why would you be mad at them? It is the difference between someone who works hard to send their kid to a private school in New York, which I think is 
just forgive me, but if, if I have the means, my kids go into a private school in New York City. They're not going to a public New uh, York uh, school. Not happening. No, I wouldn't. Uh, but what I'm saying is what I get tired of is it's the head of the teachers union doing that. It's the Democratic politicians who are telling us that they care about public schools while their kids are going to the private schools. It is uh, on the right. It's the same thing. People who argue for school choice and charter schools, but send their kids to private schools. If you're going to advocate for change in our schools, then really advocate for it. If you're going to advocate for change in the workplaces, really advocate for it and do something about it. Um, universities are incredibly progressive, supposedly, in their voting, uh, extremely progressive in their voting, especially the private and the research universities, and yet they are among the least diverse. So what they want to do is impose their version of diversity on everyone else while not having to actually practice it at, in their world. Oh, that's what I was just going to say. There's, that, that, that's an oxymoron to say that they're progressive. They're, they're, actually, they're actually regressive because they've gone back to segregation. I mean, I was just reading an article today about uh, Tufts University where they're having diversity classes, but they're segregating them. <laughs> How do you have diversity, diversity classes and segregate them into black and white classes? It's, it, well, what's, what's happened is the reason I get so frustrated with the, the rise of the, um, not pro, of the privately not progressive, progressive advocate, whatever, is it, it's a real shame to me that these individuals who are out there promoting these ideas, live and work in, in little bubbles where everyone thinks like them, who has their background, and it just, it just strikes me as very weird that if you really believed in inclusion and you really believed in diversity, that you would be living by what you're preaching exactly. and demanding that businesses and, and schools do. I wholeheartedly would say, you know, in a heartbeat, my, my wife and I were homeschooling and because we can. I would certainly send my daughters to private or charter schools. What I'm upset with is when it's the head of, say, the, the teachers union of a particular district who then sends his or her child to a private school, and it's like, well, wait a minute, you're telling us that we, we can't have school choice, that we can't have this, but since you earn a good living, your kid gets to go somewhere. That's where I start getting annoyed is I consider myself socially progressive, but you can't just fake it. That's what bothers me is the fake progressive. Um, the person who's going to say we support integration, but 25% of our students will come from what they call legacy admissions. No. No, if you believe in real inclusion, then everyone takes the same standard test or everyone has to get the same GPA, and you don't get to get into Harvard, Yale, Princeton, whatever, just because your grandfather went here. If you really believe in equality, start practicing equality. Well, I, I got to read this to you. I, I, I came across this just a couple of days ago, and I think this is the greatest saying that I've heard in a long time. It says, the world is changed by your example, not your opinion. I thought that was absolutely. The, I thought that was the greatest saying I've heard in quite a while. And it is, and that's why you know I I, I tell my children you know be cautious of the person with a lot of bumper stickers and slogans around their classroom or in their front yard or wherever. Mm -hmm. um, slogans don't don't prove what they are. What's going to matter is. How do they treat everybody? And do they treat them like stereotypes? Do they treat them uh, as individuals? How do they treat them? If they treat everyone like the groups to which they see. Um, so if someone hears that I'm autistic and then starts saying, oh, well, tell us about what it's like to be autistic. Right. No. Yeah, right. No. <laughs> what, what, huh? <laughs> Sit down. Once upon uh, a time. <laughs> a, a friend of mine who... Um, we were talking and, you know, it's, it's, it's like every time he goes somewhere, he's expected to speak about his experience. Like he knows the experience of all other people who look like him <laughs> and have, you know, and it's just like, no, that's the very problem that you're running into. Uh, you know, as we're, I think the, like, like I said, it comes down to the idea that these people want to pass laws and, and some of them, I think we absolutely need, but, 
they don't want to do the things that need to be done. Exactly. Exactly. And when you take a look at our universities and how segregated they are by class more than anything, um, it really bothers me. And it bothers me that these university professors who are out there saying what needs to be done to change the world, um, they will not actually try to change what's going on at their universities. It's, I don't know. I, I, like I said, I consider myself very socially progressive or whatever that, you know, you want to call it. Um, and I find myself at odds with the, with where our politics are as a, as a nation on both sides, because I see a lot of promises made and a lot of talk given about how we're going to pass that law, this regulation, we're going to make people do these things. <laughs> Why, that's not going to change anything. Talk that's, is what a, cheap. What a, it just makes you feel good. Oh, yay. You know, we, we passed the law that says all people are equal. Well, <laughs> yeah, okay. So what? <laughs> Talk is cheap. Talk is very cheap. Yeah, you know, I point out, um, and this is from a personal perspective, as someone who was a foster parent who adopted, mm-hmm. every single other family we met happened to be um, generally evangelical Christian. They tended to come from a conservative background. They tended to have certain values that I may not share, yep. but that's who was in the foster system. Those are the parents who were adopting. And when I talk about that to my colleagues, and I say, where were the people who keep telling us, you know, you don't get to say that the, you know, the people we don't agree with politically don't care, because when I was in the foster system, when I, now that we have adopted – most of the adoptive parents I meet don't hold my political views. They are on the right. They are conservative. They are Christians. And I respect them for what they're doing because they are practicing what they say, and they're not out there putting it up, you know, putting banners out. I adopted. Love me. Right. Um, and, and so I'm, I get really offended by that stereotyping of conservatives um, because I think too often what we're doing, those of us who, who claim to have progressive social values, we are demeaning the people that if you go look at a soup kitchen, they're the ones volunteering at a soup kitchen run by their church. Exactly. I, I, you know, it's so, funny because I found the same thing when I was, the, when I was adopting, that it was... So I find, go ahead, it, you know, yeah, it's, I don't know, it's, so for me, this... Uh, Advocacy, whether it's autism and, and special needs, um, education, whether it's any form of neurodiversity, a physical disability, it all comes down to I don't want just laws and checklists for my child. I don't want the school district to just say, well, we did the federal mandates and here's the checklist and here's the form that we filled out. I want to know, did you treat my daughters like the people they are? Did you ask them what they need? Did you treat them with respect? When we are all checklist and we're all part of these legal um, requirements, mandates, et cetera, when we, when we cease to be individuals and we become these checklists, I really fear that all that does is drive us further apart, further isolate us, and create more um, animosity between the groups. As where my animosity is often towards the very people I agree with because they're busy saying things, but not doing things. Exactly. Exactly. You know, like, like I said, uh, talk is cheap. Yeah, it's, it's very easy to say you, you believe in these rights or you believe in equality, but it's much harder to go do something. Um, everyone says they care about various things, and I will, I will say, and, and not because I'm trying to prove a point, but I, I'm trying to... to indicate my philosophy. My wife and I are very involved in our community in various ways. We are very involved in various groups and organizations when we can be. We do those things because in the end, it is harder for groups to find people willing to do things. Everyone can put a little hashtag online, post something to Facebook, but not everybody actually shows up to clean the local park. Not everyone shows up at the local animal shelter. Not everybody actually shows up at the school to volunteer or the library to volunteer. We say, oh, we want to protect libraries and we want to keep books on the shelves. And, you know, heaven forbid these people are banning books or doing this or doing that. And it's like, do you volunteer at the library? 
Do you go to the library? Do you show your support for the library? Are you just resharing a story in a, a sad faced emoji, but you haven't been to the library in 10 years? Right. Exactly. Well, they took the time so I'm to, very, to copy and paste. Yeah. And, and so I'm very much uh, someone who says, you know, we will be at these places. I've used my library card twice this week. Um, and obviously we're, we buy books too a lot, mm -hmm. you know, but my point is, is that it's not enough to say you believe these things. And that's where I get into, um, my level of frustration is it's not enough to say you want the rights for the disabled. It's not enough to say you want diversity. Then you should hire those disabled people who can do the job. You should listen to the disabled person who tells you they have specific accommodation needs. But instead of listening, you check off a box and you proud, proudly put on your website, our company hires disabled people. Well, good for you. <laughs> Prove it. <laughs> Prove, Prove that you hired disabled people. If you have to announce something on a shirt or via a slogan, maybe you're maybe you're not really doing it enough. Exactly. Well, that that goes it, back to telling people I'm a good person. Well, if you have to tell me that you're a good person, there's something about that. Then show me you're a good person. I, and I'm very worried where we are as a country, not just with disabilities, but with everything. But as a as, as a disabilities advocate, I see it. I see so much across the political spectrum that, that doesn't, re, doesn't tr treat us with the respect we need for various excuses, uh, and they make various excuses for it. And this has to stop and just treat us like the people we are. Don't give us an excuse from your, I hear from, you know, from the, Far right will hear, well, there's no money for Medicaid. We can't, you know, support, put, put, pay for special services in the schools. We can't install those ramps. We can't fix those windows. We can't, we can't, we can't. And, and obviously we can. I, I can sit down. I taught in an economics department at a, at a really great university. And, um, I, I can show you how in a budget you can change things. There, There is so much waste in government. It's pretty easy to move some money around. Uh, but we don't do that. We we build things that don't need to be built uh, to put, put names on them and to have shrines to the local politician. You know, I, I look at California's bullet train, the high-speed rail in California, and all the billions and billions and billions wasted on that. And how much of that money could have gone to local transit that would have hap helped disabled people get on a local bus to go to a local job? How much of that could have done paratransport? How much of that could have improved sidewalks and signals for the, for the blind with better tone lights? How much of that money was wasted on a bullet train that may never get finished that had been redirected money that could have made a difference in so many lives in so many cities in California? Instead, we're going to look at a... I don't know. The last I saw was a hundred billion dollars, and it may never be finished, according to the New York Times yesterday. But I'm going to play devil's advocate here, and again, I'm disabled. I have several disabilities. As I said, I'm in a wheelchair. But the dis the people with disabilities also have to step up. They can't sit back and say, "Do for me, do for me, do for me." They have to step up and get involved as well. You can't sit oh, back have and, and have a pity party and wait for someone else to do for you all the time. I'm not saying that, you know, it's up to you to take care of it 100%, but it is up to you to pitch in as a disabled I person. Will be, I will be blunt. The thing that we need to do is we need to get involved in our local school boards, our local city councils, our uh, state yes. elections, our federal elections. We need to say, okay, we have a limited budget. Let's look at that budget. Let's prioritize people. Yes. Uh, or just today, this morning, I put out a podcast this morning. It's how people with disabilities can vote. And it's put oh, out. Oh, absolutely. It's put out by the Department of Social Security. And it gives you all the options how you can vote. It's so important that everybody votes. There's 38.3 million disabled people in this country. That's a lot of people. 
and you can get out and vote. Yeah. And it, never before has it been so easy for a person with a disability to vote. And it's that I important. will, I will say that this is one of those things again where the the political parties both have it wrong. And this is what's so sad is voting is so essential to our communities, our disabled communities, all of our communities, every American. It's it's important for everyone in the United States. Every adult who can, you know, read and understand the issues should be able to vote easily. Exactly. And I have if the parties instead of instead of playing games with it, which is what they're both doing, I would love to see, as we do in Texas, Texas has early voting, and it's open for nearly a week. I can vote at um, a local grocery store. Mm -hmm. um, a local grocery store chain happens to be a precinct. I can vote down the street. The early voting is even open on weekends from 7 to 7 on Saturday, and I think noon to 7 on Sundays. And yet I hear uh, from the opposing party, how incredibly hard and difficult and horrible it is to vote in Texas. Is, I, we have two weeks of early voting. Are you telling me that in two weeks you can't go down the street to your gro I It is less than a half mile to my local voting place. Anyone in the U.S., anyone in the U.S. can go to eac.gov and find out how they can vote. And that goes. And that's for the for the people with disabilities. They can go to eac.gov, any any state in the U.S. and find out how they can vote. Whether they can vote from home, whether they can vote online. In South Carolina, I pulled up to the voting to the voting station in my car. My wife went in and told them I was disabled. How could how could I come in? They came out to me. With the machine, and let me vote right there in my car. I think we need to. I think the parties would would benefit everybody if they would depoliticize all of the shenanigans that the Republicans are trying to say they're protecting the vote, which there's so little statistical evidence of of actual fraud. What we we need to do is is secure the vote. Sure, I am all for simple moves that would, would prove that there's a paper trail, that a paper trail can be audited. I'm all for that. But I'm also for, I think we should have universal, nationwide, early voting, vote by mail for anyone who has any good, legitimate le reason for vote by mail anywhere in this country, whether it's someone stationed overseas, someone who has a physical uh, limitation. I don't understand how voting became a political issue again after the 1960s. We should be way past this, and both parties should want to be appealing to voters instead of trying to choose their voters and limit voting and change this. And well, I agree with one you. One of the things I agree with you that what, voting should be if you're overseas, if you're if you're in the uh, if you're in the service. I I agree if you're disabled, but I don't agree <laughs> that you if you're too lazy to get up and go to. The, the polls. That I, I'm sorry, I don't agree with that. I agree that. Well, if, the sad. Go ahead. I'm sorry. This, the the sad thing is, is as I said, both parties do this. If you take a look at New York, New York schedules all kinds of little elections throughout the year on dates where they're not all unified. Like the school board election might be on this day, mm -hmm. and okay, we're going to do this this special the irrigation district and the sanitation district on this date. By not consolidating those voting days, they make it hard for people to keep track of when to vote, where right. to vote, instead of just, okay, we are going to vote in June for the primary, November yep. for the general, every year, June and November. We're not going to have elections in April for school board, yep. July for the – no, June, November, boom, period. That's what – I agree. But what happens is both parties play these little games, especially with things like school board and city council mm -hmm. and all these little districts, and – for what they don't remember, or that maybe, I'm certainly they do remember, is they are disenfranchising the disabled, the lower uh, socioeconomic groups. They are disenfranchising, and both parties play this game, and I'm tired of them saying they don't. It doesn't matter if it's a Democratic legislature drawing their maps or a Republican legislature drawing their maps. Everyone plays these games, and the disabled and the uh, marginalized communities pay a price for this, and I am tired of one side blaming the other because given a chance, these politicians play games with our lives. I agree with you. And 
And I don't know how to end it other than to keep voting and to keep voting for the people that I think are the the lesser, <laughs> the <laughs> least <laughs> the lesser evil. You know? I I and that's so heartbreaking as a disabled individual who just wants to be a participant in society. Um, I just want to be treated with respect, and too often I think that they put up barriers because they don't want us to participate. They don't want to hear from us. They don't want they don't want us to tell them that you know, this thing you're doing with our money is a waste, but you could help out a whole lot of people by spending your money wisely. They they just don't want to hear it. I know how we could fix this. You run, I'll be your running mate. <laughs> <laughs> and we'll take over. <laughs> well, you know, I'm very opinionated, and I think I have to be because too often, um, as you said, my, my, um, hey, I consider myself, as I said, cer- certainly socially progressive. I certainly support uh, the rights of all individuals to, to participate and be heard. And the problem is, is that I don't like what has turned into um, Twitter and Facebook and Instagram, TikTok, the social media campaigns that aren't real change. They are fake feel good change. Um, th- that's not what you do. What you do is you get your yourself out of your your house or out of your comfort zone you can do it online if there are things you can do like create websites for nonprofits if if you do have to work from home there are things you can do out in the world but and that that's what we have to do and unfortunately we are so far apart you know i i live in austin texas in austin texas the people who live here don't have any understanding of rural Texas or even West Texas. So for them, they cannot understand. In their, you ask anyone in Austin, they will tell you, well, I don't know anyone who voted for the current guy. I don't know anyone who voted for Who voted for him? Well, that's because the, we live in our little bubble, well, that's in our same, little bubble. That's the same thing here in New York. Nobody nobody in New York, in in New York City, knew anyone that voted for Trump. You know, they, right. they wouldn't admit it. But the, And the numbers are there. The, the data show that people in cities vote very different from people in the uh, suburbs and the, and the rural areas. Of course. And we don't talk to each other. We don't travel through each other's worlds. Um, you know, and, and I point out to people that uh, individuals like myself, I'll sit there and I will argue for... Um, I will argue against uh, schools removing books from the library. I would argue for certain things that are um, that need to be taught in in our world. But um, when you sit down with someone and you explain it, you find out that there's common ground. I would love to have open discussion of history in its real form. You know, let's discuss that FDR was disabled. Let's discuss that you know JFK was disabled. Let's look at our our history through uh, reality, which is that we were horrible to immigrants, that we, we have a history of racism and ableism and classism. And you can do that. And if you sit down with whether it's a conservative voter or a, a progressive voter, and you say, how can we teach history as it is without saying that um, today is wrong? But no, they want to say, well, you know, we need to teach your kids that they are all this or all that. And it's like, no, it's, I think most parents want to hear, I want to teach the facts. And the facts include that many of our our leaders, many of our heroes were disabled individuals. You know, they were, they were people who had um, physical limitations, cognitive limitations. Let's teach about them and teach about them honestly. Let's teach about racism honestly. Let's teach about the Civil War honestly, the Civil Rights Movement honestly, the Disability Rights Movement honestly. But the problem is, is everyone wants to make these political things when most parents and most individuals just want the kids to know the facts, let the parents teach about the morals and the values that go along with those facts. Um, but instead, we, we get these city council meetings and school board meetings that are shouting matches. We get left, right geographic design uh, delineations, uh, when if we just sat down, we probably agree 
on 70 or 80 percent of things, and we just don't know we agree because the politicians don't want us to know we agree. Exactly. What? And, and as a disabled person, I don't want to be somebody's token. I don't want to be somebody's, um, oh, look at us. We, we care so much about the disabled. Right. Like you said, the, I am not, I, when I sound angry about the people sending their kids to private school or getting private health care, the reason I'm angry about it is it reminds me of these people who are kings or, or prime ministers in these uh, democratic socialist countries. Where do they come for health care? You don't find if a German chancellor gets sick, you don't see him using Germany's health care. You see that individual, him or her, flying to, to the, the uh, Mayo Clinic in Minnesota. So, you know, I, I, I don't – these people who say we want these systems, oh, you want these systems, but you don't want them for you. Right, exactly. That's what bothers me. That's where I get frustrated is, well, we think you shouldn't be allowed to have a charter school. Okay, so you don't want tax money to go to charter schools. So we can't have a fine arts school. We can't have a, a, a science and technology school. But you, the teachers you know, union president, send your kid to a private school that does have those programs. Well, I'm sorry, but we should all have the same rights and privileges if you're going to do that. You can send your kid to a private school. Good for you, but don't then tell me that I can't advocate for a charter school in my district. Don't, I, just, I get frustrated with the double standards that, that we constantly hear, and, and it just breaks my heart that the, these politicians – uh, and trust me, it's not the teachers. It's the union leadership. It's not the it's not the the uh, conservative voters. It's the conservative politicians. It's it's the leaders of our groups that want us to hate each other. Oh yeah, that's how that's how they they conquer. They divide and conquer. Yep. Well, and so that's where I'm coming from as an advocate. Is I I find that if I sit down with a disabled individual or the parent of a disabled uh, young adult or teen or whatever. When we sit down and talk about things, we can come up with solutions, and they're reasonable, and everyone can agree they're, they're, they're doable, or however imperfect they are, they're doable. But that's not how politics in our country is working anymore. No. Well, Christopher, I'm sorry, but we've gone over a little bit here. And um. <laughs> I appreciate everything. Everything. It's been a, it's been, this has been a great chat, I'll tell you that. And I really, well, I'm, I really appreciate you being here. I, I've learned well, a lot. You. I've learned a lot. Thank me. you so much. I, like I said, I, I think that those of us who are passionate about change, um, it only means something if you're doing something about it. Well, you're definitely out there. You're out there doing it. You're definitely out there. And I've, like I said, I've learned a lot from you today. I actually... Well, I, I, I think the key is we can disagree on things and what we can find is common ground. And I wish that we could do that as, as human beings. Well, we can, we can disagree. There's, there's things that you said that I'm not exactly in agreement with, but at the end of the day, I respect you. So I respect your opinion. And that means a lot. If we respect each other, we have to be able to respect each other. And, if we all agreed all the time, what a boring place this would be. Well, unfortunately, everyone wants a litmus test. You have to agree on every single topic or somehow you're not on the same team. We've reached the point now where when I criticize, when I criticize individuals who hold some of the same social values I do for their views, then they'll say, oh, well, you're not, you don't really believe in equality and diversity because you don't support all of the things we support. Right. And it, if I'm talking to conservatives and I'm talking about, I do believe in budget constraint. I do believe in tax caps. I believe our, our federal debt at $31 trillion is absurd. We have got to, but then suddenly they'll say, but you're not a real conservative because you're not a Christian conservative. It's like, <laughs> oh my gosh. Can we not just all sit down and say, things are a mess, we need to fix this, because we are all stuck here together. Everyone has to take a deep breath and take the potty <laughs> tags off. You know? Uh, yes, absolutely. Well, Christopher, it's this, been an honor. This has been great. I really appreciate it. And I'd love to have you back on again. I, I could continue going on like this all day. 
Right. Well, and I could certainly talk about actual disability experiences, <laughs> but it all comes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm not my disabilities. I'm my passions. I'm not my disabilities. I'm my passions. Exactly. Exactly. And that's what I love about this conversation. Again, I want to thank you for being here today. And I definitely want to talk to you again. So thank you so much. Have a wonderful day. You too, buddy. Thank you. Have a good one. I want to thank Dr. Wyeth for being with us again today. And his contact information will be in the show notes. So if you missed it, don't worry about it. It's there. And I want to thank you for being here today. It means a lot to me. And I want to remind you about the apple fritters that come up every day, Monday through Friday. They're there for you also. And I want to remind you, things can always be worse. That's right, my friends. Things can always be worse. Right now, there's somebody somewhere wishing that they were in your position. So things can always be worse. Hey, you've been listening to An Apple A Day. My name is Jimmy Apple, and I'll talk to you again real soon. Have a great day, my friends. Thanks for listening to An Apple A Day with Jimmy Apple, your gateway to a happy, healthy life. Join our community at www.famousapple.com. See you next time.